All right, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to take it with me. Look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I think it's important that you look into the Word of God and see the things that I'm going to teach to you today. Uh, We're in a series talking about God's greatest gift. As a reminder, God's greatest gift to the world was his son, Jesus. Not all the world has accepted that, but if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, God's greatest gift to you is the Holy Spirit. And so we're talking about, we've talked about several different subjects, but today specifically, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit empowers, that God through the Holy Spirit wants to empower your life. And we're going to talk about the empowerment of God for several weeks uh, on the spiritual gifts that he has given us. All right. So look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse one, as we look at this to help you Uh, many theologians believe, including myself, I believe that when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he was actually addressing some questions that came to him. And uh, uh, there's probably, there was probably a third book of Corinthians that we no longer have, uh, and uh, for whatever reason, but somewhere along the way, the Corinthian church wrote to Paul and said, hey, would you help us answer some questions for us about Christian living? What does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean to be believers? So when we get to verse one here, notice what he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, as if he's answering the question, hey, Paul, what about spiritual gifts? What does this look like for us? So Paul addresses that question. So now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be unaware Uh, One of the translations that I actually think is one of my favorite translations of this verse says, and I believe it's NIV, says, I do not want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be stupid about this thing. I don't want you to be ignorant about it. I want you to be smart about this thing. I want you to understand the truths of God. So he says, I don't want you to be unaware. Verse two, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols. However, you were led. And just as uh, help us understand this, listen, you're going to be led no matter what. You need to understand that. You are either going to be led uh, by the Spirit of God or you're going to be led by the world. And by the way, let me just help you understand something. The God of this world, the prince of the power of the, of the air here, is Satan himself. And so you're either led by the Holy Spirit or you're led by an unholy spirit. You need to understand. There's no choices here. Someone says, well, I'm just not going to be led by either one. Well, you've made the choice. You're going to be led by an unholy spirit. That's just the way that's going to be. You were led. You're going to be led. Verse 3 says, therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts. Now, he's going to get into this, but I want you to notice some things. So if you're highlighting in your Bible, you ought to highlight But by the same spirit, the same spirit, highlight, same spirit. He says there are a variety of gifts, but it's the same spirit. Verse uh, five says there are a variety of ministries, but it's the same Lord, highlight, same Lord. And then verse six says there are a variety of effects, but it's the same God, highlight, same God who works all things in all persons. Let's pause right there for a moment. Do you notice in those three verses, verse four, verse five, and verse six, same spirit, same Lord, same God, do you see the Trinity? Shake your head yes or amen or something. Help me know you're alive, all right? Do you see it? Same spirit, same Lord, same God. Do you see it? There's the Trinity right there in three verses. And I I just wanna bring this up because I have a certain belief about spiritual gifts that I think is important that we figure this out. There are basically three main uh, books or three main chapters that deal with spiritual gifts. We have Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians chapter four. And, and I know someone in the room is really sharp and is gonna go, but pastor, what about 1 Peter four? Well, 1 Peter four really doesn't address spiritual gifts. It just says he knows you have some spiritual gifts and it doesn't go into them. So you have three main passages of Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians four. Uh, and here he tells us, he starts by saying there are a variety of gifts, but it's the same spirit. And in this passage, in just a little while, he's going to say, these are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I believe that 1 Corinthians 12, when he says there are a variety of gifts, 
that it's literally talking about 1 Corinthians 12 right here. And then he says, and there are a variety of ministries. Well, we know Ephesians chapter 4, and he says it's the same Lord. Jesus is speaking to the church in Ephesians, and it says, and he, Jesus, gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers fivefold ministry gifts. Ministry gifts. He says he gave those to equip the saints for works of ministry. Okay. Is it possible that what Paul is trying to tell us is, here I'm going to talk about Holy Spirit gifts. In Ephesians 4, he talks about ministries, ministry gifts that, um, that I give to the church to equip saints to do the work of ministry. And if that's the case, could it be that Romans chapter 12 is talking about natural gifts that the Father gives to humanity? And I would say yes. So I want you to pick up on this. He says there's three things. The Father gives certain things. The Son gives certain things to the church, gifts to the church. And the Holy Spirit gives certain gifts to the church. And here's what I would say to you, because there's a lot of people who would say, well, I just don't know if I agree with that. That's okay. So, okay, I'm giving you, this is my opinion, how I believe that God lined us out, that Romans 12 were natural gifts that every person who ever lives is getting a gift from the Father, giving a gift from God. So, you just think about it. how many times have you ever seen someone that you go, they are so gifted, they are so talented, wonder why they don't know Jesus. Okay, listen, I just think God gives gifts to humanity because he loves humanity and he wants humanity to come to him, but... If you're not a believer, you don't get in on the other two. You only get in on the first one. And you can say, well, pastor, I don't know if I agree with that. That's okay, you can be wrong. It's all right, all right. So, <laughs> but I want us to pick up on that because he's literally showing us the Trinity in these three verses. Verse seven says, and he's gonna go into this where he says, variety of gifts with the same spirit. Verse seven says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Now, I want, to, I want you to pick up on something because he says to each one, let me tell you what he didn't say. To each one is given one of these spiritual gifts. That's not what he said. Did you notice that? What he said was to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Listen to me. These gifts manifest the presence of the Spirit in your life. And he says to each one, so you're not going to get one of these gifts. What you get is you get the Holy Spirit and you don't get part of the Holy Spirit. You get all of the Holy Spirit. And at any given time and at any given moment, the Holy Spirit can choose to manifest his presence in your life in any of these ways that he so chooses to manifest himself. He might choose to manifest in your life through healing or through miracles or through faith or through words of wisdom or through words of knowledge. But it's up to him to decide what he wants to manifest in your life about himself. Do you see that? So he says, it's not, these are not spiritual gifts in the sense that you get one. These are gifts of the Spirit. And he chooses how he wants to use them in your life. He gets to choose. So watch this. He says, verse 8, for to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit. Notice that a word of wisdom is given How? Through the, through the Spirit, for the common good. In other words, he's going to do this. It's for all of these gifts are for the common good. It's for the family of God. It's for the family. It's for the church. It is for the common good. It's for the common purpose that God has given them. And they all come through the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says, for to one is given a word of wisdom. How? Through the Spirit. And to another, a word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. And verse 9, to another faith, how? By the same Spirit. And to another gifts of healing, how? By that one Spirit. Now, you need to pick up on all that because notice, as he starts this, he says all of these are gifts that are given by the Spirit, that come through the Spirit. Verse 9 says, to another faith, uh, did I already do that one? Okay, look at verse 10. And to another, <laughs> I'll pick up. And to another, the effecting of miracles and the inference is by that same spirit. It's an inference there. In other words, he's inferring that it's all by the same spirit. I'll prove that to you as we get to the end. But he says, to another effecting of miracles, the inference is by that same spirit. To another prophecy, the inference is by that same spirit. To another, the distinguishing of spirits, 
by that same Spirit. To another, various kinds of tongues, the inference being by the same Spirit. To another, the interpretation of tongues, and the inference is by that same Spirit. And someone says, how do you know that was the inference? Verse 11, but one and the same Spirit work all these things. Did you pick up on that? In other words, these all are things of the Spirit that he chooses to manifest himself as he chooses in your life. And notice what he says, how he ends this, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. It is his will, not your will, not your plan, not, well, this is the one I choose right now. Well, that's not how this is going to work. The Holy Spirit chooses to work how he wants to work, when he wants to work, where he wants to work, through, through whom he wants to work. He wants to manifest himself, by the way, I want to say this very clearly, in you so as the world can see him in you. This is the Holy Spirit that he has for you in your life. So, Let me start by making this big, broad, sweeping statement. God is not limited in his scope of power. God, let me say it again. God is not limited in his scope of power. However, however, we as individuals can limit the manifestation of the presence of God in us. We can actually subvert his presence in our life where we'll say, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not allowing that to happen in my life. That'll never happen in my presence. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit, it's like throwing a bucket of water on him. The Holy Spirit says, fine, I won't show up. I'm in you, but I'm not going to come out and show out in you. I'm not going to empower you in your life. And so God is not limited in his scope of power, but we can limit God's scope of power in us. Did you hear me? So let's not do that. How about we be a people that says, Lord, whatever you want is what I want. Wherever you want me to be is where I want to be. Whatever you want me to speak and whatever you want me to say is what I want to say. God, use me, make me an instrument for your glory and for your kingdom. So God is not limited in his scope of power. Now, originally when I planned this message, I had planned to talk about three different spiritual gifts today. And I had had that fully intentioned to do. When I finished the service this morning, I didn't get very far. I actually only made it through two. So we're only going to do two spiritual gifts. And so if you're looking at my notes and you wonder what in the world, why did he not do number three? I will pick up number three. It'll be number one next week. How about that? All right. So what I wanted to talk about today was healing miracles, and faith. Next week, I'll start with faith, all right? Are y'all good with that? So when you look look at my notes, you're gonna get a precursor to next week's message when you look at faith, and you're gonna still wonder what in the world is he talking about? All right, so here we go. So let's talk about healing. Let's start with healing today. Uh, I am not doing this in the order that 1 Corinthians mentions them, but you may remember that he actually says in verse number Uh, let me see if I can find it again. Verse number nine, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing, and to another the effecting of miracles. And so I want to talk about healing today. Let me give you a definition for healing, all right? Here it is. It is a supernatural intervention by the Holy Spirit in the ordinary course of human health. Let me say it one more time. It is a supernatural intervention by the Holy Spirit in the ordinary course of human health. In other words, uh, if you don't know this, this body is frail. uh, And we're all going to get sick at some point. let's Let's just test the waters real quick. How many of you have ever been sick? in your life. Let me just see your hand real quick. Should have every hand up in the air. It's always funny. You'll find that one person. Oh, I have, by faith, I have never been sick. (laughs) Okay. Listen, we all have the opportunity in the normal course of human health of being sick on some level. It may just be a cold or it could be, uh, it could be a flu, uh, some kind of virus. It could be all kinds of things. We can all be sick in this world. Healing is when the Holy Spirit intervenes in the natural course of health and and supernaturally changes its direction. 
and only he can do that. So let me give you a couple of verses of scripture about that. Matthew chapter eight, verse 14 says, when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and waited on him. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all, what you notice that word all, who were ill. This was to, to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Okay, so I'm, I just want to mention something here because I think sometimes we get confused when we see things in Scripture. Because we see this little statement that he's, he healed all sickness and he carried away all of our diseases and so then you have to answer the question, why is it then that we still get sick? Why do we still get diseases? Now, let me just make this very clear to you. God is still in the healing business today. He has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we have to be honest and answer the question, then why do we still get sick? Well, I think it's because we've actually sometimes looked at Scripture and misinterpreted it. In fact, I just want you to notice that word all again. Look at verse number 16, and healed all who were ill. That word all, a lot of, most of the time in scripture, the word all is, means all, and that's all that all will ever mean. But in this particular case, you can go look it up. The Greek word for all here means uh, all of every kind. It also means all of uh, sorts of, means all sorts of. What he's literally talking about is he healed all kinds of diseases, he healed, all, he healed all sorts of, of sicknesses and illnesses. So the question comes, did Jesus heal every single person who was sick? And you would, if you look at that passage right on the face of it, you go, oh, he healed every single person that was sick. Well, let me ask you this question. How is it then that we get into the first part of the book of Acts and we find that there's a man who's sitting outside the gate, beautiful, leading into the temple, was Jesus I promise you went in many times into the temple, many times into the temple, and would have gone through the gate beautiful many times. And the Bible tells us that that man had been laying there for years outside of that, outside of the temple, begging for alms as people came in. Yet, Jesus most likely walked past him at some point, but never healed him. However, after Jesus had already ascended back into heaven, Peter and John were walking into the temple and he was begging for alms, begging for money. Help me, help the poor, help the poor man, help me out. And, P and, and Peter says to the man, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he rose up and walked that day. Could it be possible that Jesus didn't heal all because it wasn't their time, nor was it their place to be healed in that moment, but to bring glory to himself, he allowed them to continue through the sickness and the ailment that they had until the appropriate moment to heal them. There you go. I want to make sure y'all are with me. Yes. Because that's exactly what happens in the story. He left him to be healed by Peter and John. And we find that as you read through the book of Acts, there were many others who were healed in the book of Acts that most likely had seen Jesus when he was on the earth. So here's what I want to say to you about healing. You need to get this about healing. I believe that healing comes in three forms. And I've witnessed this in my own personal life, all right? So I believe, I still believe in a miracle working God who still does healings this day. Still does them to this day. Uh, back, in, uh, back in the late 90s, uh, I, was, I was a cessationist. If you don't know what a cessationist is, a cessationist was someone who believes that certain gifts no longer exist any longer. And I, had, I came up out of that. I, I went to school, they actually taught cessationism. And I, I actually fell into the trap of believing that certain gifts no longer exist. And when God began to reveal to me that he has not changed, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he still does healing, I remember one particular morning, 
Uh, my wife, Lisa, hates me to tell this story, but I'm gonna tell the story anyway. So, but I remember saying, Lord, do you still heal, heal today? And the Lord said, yes. And I said, well, will you heal my infirmity, my sickness, my ailment that I have in my life? Will you heal it? And at that time, and I, and I think still to this day, uh, the infirmity that I had, the only way that you could get rid of it is basically surgical. That was the only way to, to do that. And that you were going to have it the rest of your life. And so uh, the Lord says, you'll ask me, I'll heal you. Now, let me tell you what he healed me of, all right? Because I think, there, I think that it's actually funny, in my opinion. God healed me of hemorrhoids. That was the only ailment that I had. I just want you to know that. And I played sports and you know, a lot of guys that play sports or even young ladies that play sports know it's, it, you know, one of the possible side effects of working out a lot is hemorrhoids. That's just the way it is. And I asked the Lord, would you heal me? The Lord said, if you'll ask me, I'll heal your hemorrhoids. Listen, I didn't even think to check But the next morning when I got in the shower, the Lord reminded me, now you asked me, and guess what? Since, since the late 90s, I've not had any hemorrhoids. Per permanent healing of my hemorrhoids. Praise the Lord for that. And maybe that's no big deal to you, but that was a big deal to me. I just want you to know that. I don't have the itch anymore. So anyway, so. This is why Lisa doesn't like me to talk about this. I think it's comical, personally, you know. It's almost like the Lord saying, well, you've been a butt all these years. Let me heal it. Am I allowed to say that? All right. Too late. So I believe in a supernatural healing because I've witnessed it in my own life. By the way, I've also, I've seen, I've seen people healed of Crohn's disease, which there is no modern medicine today that can heal. You can actually get rid of some of the symptoms off of Crohn's, but you can't heal Crohn's. And I've seen people healed of Crohn's. I've, I've seen people, I'm talking about people that I have known personally, that I have prayed for personally. I've seen people who were deaf in their ear and God heal deaf ears. So listen to me. Don't try and convince me that God doesn't supernaturally heal. He still heals today. He is still in this business today. But here's the second thing that I'd like for you to get. Not only does he heal supernaturally, but I believe that God does a mental healing too. You know, you, there's just, I believe that what happens is there's some people, some ailments that God says, I, it's not that he can't, but he chooses not to heal it because he believes he can get greater glory in your life by not taking away the infirmity, but healing you mentally in your mind to accept the infirmity to still give glory to God. Johnny Erickson Tata is probably one of the greatest, uh, I think, examples, modern day examples of someone who uh, she actually was swimming, that she dove off a platform into some shallow water, ended up breaking her neck. She's paralyzed literally from the neck down. She has no movement from, uh, on, the, on her lower part of her body, but she can still move her head and her neck. And she has, God healed her mentally to accept the infirmity that's in her life and she can now take a paintbrush and they'll put it in her mouth and she'll paint some of those beautiful pictures that you've ever seen to bring glory to God in the midst of her infirmity. And God heals us sometimes mentally saying, I want you to accept the infirmity that's in your life so that you will still bring me glory. We find that even in scripture. We find the apostle Paul comes and says, he said, I asked the Lord, I had a thorn in my flesh. Most people think that it might've been his eyesight. It may have been something else. We're not sure. But he said, I asked three times that God would take away this thorn in my flesh, that he would remove it from my life. And three times God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. That's all you're going to get from me, Paul. You're going to have to live with this flesh issue that you've got. Whatever this infirmity that is in your flesh, you live with it and you accept it and you bring me glory in spite of this infirmity that's in your life. And so I believe that God heals uh, supernaturally, the one that we all like to ask for. I believe that God heals mentally that sometimes he just says, I want you to bring me glory in spite of the situation that you are in. But then there's a third way that God heals. And I don't know many people who pray for it. It's what I refer to as the permanent healing. You do know that one day we're all gonna die. 
And we're gonna get a brand new body that's not afflicted by the pain and the suffering and the cancer and the heart issues and the lung issues. We're gonna have a brand new body and it is a permanent healing. Anyone wanna pray for that right now? Hey, come on up, we'll pray over you right now that God will bring a permanent healing into your life. And I know some of you are like, Pastor, I don't want that one. I'm not ready to go on the next bus load or anything. But it is part of the healing process. And we ought to go, man, you know, listen, death should not scare us. Oh, death, where is your sting? <laughs> For we get glory through Jesus Christ. And even when we die, there's healing in death. That I'm, I'm not gonna have knees that are sore anymore, a back that hurts. I'm not gonna have heart issues or lung issues. We are going to, listen, be perfectly 100% well in the presence of the Lord. And let me just say something real quick about supernatural healing. All supernatural healing is temporary. Did you hear me? By the way, we're gonna pray for healing today, and I believe it. I believe that God can heal some of you, but you just need to understand it's temporary. Uh, one day, you're going to die, and on your death certificate, they're going to put a reason why you died, and most of the time, it's because you were sick. I, I mean, I know we have some sickos in the room, but listen, I'm talking about really sick, right? You had, they had heart disease, or they had lung issues, or they had all kinds of things that we could put on that death certificate. We're all going to die of some kind of sickness at some point. So listen, at its best, supernatural healing is temporary healing, but permanent healing is the best healing. And one day we'll be with him with a brand new body. Aren't you looking forward to that day? I am. I am looking forward to it. So we need to understand that. Think about this real quick. Uh, I'm going to give you another verse of scripture. Psalms 103 verse 1, 2, and 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Someone says, well, what did we do with that, Pastor? I mean, uh, you know, he heals all of your diseases. Well, we could look at it in two ways. Number one, we could look and say, he heals all your diseases. Maybe he heals you uh, supernaturally, or he heals you uh, mentally, or he would heal you permanently. There's also another way to look at that because we know that when Psalms is written, oftentimes there are these giant absolutes that are written into it that potentially it was never intended to say this was for every single person, for every single occasion, for every single thing. We do 100% believe exactly what it says. He's healed all of your diseases. That's not a problem for God. There's nothing too big for him. But is it possible that it wasn't meant for you at this particular time to heal your disease like that at this time. Well, in order to answer that question, I want you just to think about another passage of scripture real quick. This passage has nothing to do with healing, but there are some absolutes that are in it. Okay, watch what happens. Psalm 91 verse 11 says, for he will give his angels charge concerning you. How many of you believe, I mean, I do, how many of you believe that we have angels that are watching over our life? I do, 100% believe that. And so he says he'll give his angels charge over you to guard you in all of your ways. Notice that giant absolute that's mentioned there. Verse 12 says they will bear you up in their hands, these angels, and you, uh, that you do not strike your foot against the stone. Okay, I just want to think about this for a second. Uh, have you ever struck your foot against a stone or a bedpost in the middle of the night? or those little ungodly toys called Legos. Okay, so what happened? Was your angel asleep? Notice this giant absolute that says that he, they're going to guard your life and you won't even strike your foot on a stone. Okay, so what do we do with something like that when we know that's not exactly what happens? Well, let me give you another verse of scripture that'll help us with that. Matthew chapter four, is the passage where Jesus is led out to be tempted by Satan. Do you remember this? Jesus being tempted three times by Satan. And I'm gonna give you the middle time. So Matthew chapter four, verse six says, and he said to him, this is the devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you. Does that sound familiar to you? And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil quoted that passage out of Psalm 91 to Jesus. But what did Jesus say? Verse seven, Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not tempt, uh, he says, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. <coughs> so here's what Jesus was saying. That verse is relevant, it's true, but it's not for right now, for this occasion, for this situation, for this opportunity. Did you get that? So again, Yes, we believe all that the word of God says. We wholly, 100% believe it, but we need to understand that not every single scripture was written for every single situation in my life for this exact moment, for this exact occasion right now. Are y'all with me on this? So someone says, well then, if God does supernatural healing and God does mental healing, what should we do when we're sick? Well, we should do what scripture tells us to do. So James chapter five, verse 13 says, very clearly, this is what we should do when we're sick. Uh, if anyone among you, is anyone among you suffering, then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sin they will be forgiven him therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much I mean, let's make a statement here. I believe that's exactly what we should do. Whenever we're sick, we should call the elders of the church. We should have them pray over us and, and anoint us with oil and, and, and in the name of the Lord and the, and the Lord can restore. And I wanted to say this very clearly. He might restore a temporarily or spir uh, supernaturally or, or he might restore mentally or he might restore permanently but it's his choice, not ours, because God is sovereign. And you always hear these people. I, I'm, I just want to make it very clear. I really am a charismatic. I, I believe in the charismatic things. But I want to, because the word charismata means uh, with grace. That's what charismata means. And so I am with grace. I fully believe in the grace of God. But here's what I wanted to say to you. A lot of times we have charismatic brothers say, well, you know, the reason they didn't get healed is because they just didn't have enough faith. If they had just had enough faith. Show me one verse that says that they had to have enough faith. Well, this passage says that the problem was your prayers didn't have enough faith. That hurts. So we, here's what we always like to fall on. Well, it was never my fault. It had to be theirs. What if it's not the prayer's fault? And what, what if it's not the person who's sick fault? What if it's God's choice? Are you with me on this? But we still were obedient to what God called us to do. And we left it in the hands of an almighty, sovereign God who knows what he's doing. Because he's a good God and all things work together for good. Not that all things are good, but all things work together for good to those who love him. Amen? So that's what we need to understand about healing. Okay, let me give you the second and we'll go fast on this one. And that is miracles. Healing and miracles are two different things. Oftentimes I hear people say, God performed a miracle, he healed me. Two different things. Healing is healing, miracles are miracles, all right? So uh, miracles are, here's the definition, a supernatural intervention by the Holy Spirit in the ordinary course of nature. Let me say it one more time. It is a supernatural intervention by the Holy Spirit in the ordinary course of nature. Uh, a miracle would be Jesus walking on water. That's not healing. That's a miracle. Can we all agree with that? The ordinary course of nature is you try and walk on water, you're going to sink. It was a miracle when Peter said, if it's you, Lord, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come to me. And here's the part we got to remember. He walked on water. We often think about he sank, 
but he first walked on water and then he had a loss of faith that caused him to sink and Jesus reached out and recovered him. Okay, do you get this? So it was a miracle to walk on water. Uh, I have, in my personal life, have experienced what I believe was a miracle. In fact, I've ex actually experienced several different miracles in my life. Uh, I've never uh, walked on water. I want to make that very clear to you. Uh, I have water skied, but I've never walked on water. But uh, many years ago, back in, I, when I told you I was a cessationist in, in the late 90s, uh, I was, uh, when the God was really dealing with me about this whole subject of him, he's still involved in our life and everything. Pastor David and I were pastoring a church in North Carolina at the time. And, uh, Pastor David and I got away and we went camping and, uh, we had gone fishing all day long and uh, caught a bunch of fish and had cleaned a bunch of fish. And, uh, at the end of the day, we'd sat around the campfire and the smoke coming off the campfire was on us. We smelled like stinky fish and campfire, and we had sweat all day long, and it was the end of the day, and it was dark outside, and we were in a state park. That's important to the story. So we decided, I just said, you know, I think I'd like to take a shower before I crawl in that tent all nasty and grubby and sticky before we go to bed. And Pastor David says, you know, I think I'll walk down there with you. I think I'd like to do the same thing. So we go down to the little shower house that's at the state park, took a quick shower, came out, of the shower and just, it was a beautiful night. The stars were out, the moon was out. Uh, you could see fairly well, but you know, you're kind of in this big tree canopy. So it was a little shady and shadowy. And we're just, we said, you know what? Let's just walk back to camp. And so we started walking back. We didn't turn on our flashlights or anything. We're walking down the road. And as we're walking down the road, I'm standing here. Pastor David is to my right. We're walking down the road. Pastor David suddenly kind of does this like half skip stumble step where he kind of goes, like that. And I said, what's wrong? He goes, I don't know. There was something standing, something down in the road down there. I turned around, turned on my flashlight and there was an Eastern diamondback rattlesnake that was about that long laying in the road, never rattled, never did anything. Now you have to get this picture. The head was pointed this direction. I did not step on the snake, but I was right beside pastor David, meaning that booger's head was right next to my foot. And Pastor David put his foot right in the middle of the back of that snake. Now here's what you gotta get. That snake didn't bite me and didn't bite him. I don't know why, but I would call it a miracle. I mean, I, God protected me. It's like God was saying, see, you were, try, you were just now figuring out I heal. Now you've just figured out I do miracles too. And you know, there's a verse of scripture that says they shall take up deadly serpents and they won't hurt them. Now, Let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 12. I don't want you to be ignorant. <laughs> Let me say this very clearly. We were in North Carolina, but we weren't serpent handlers. Have y'all seen those people on TV, you know? And they're dancing around, and they're holding rattlesnakes and everything. And they think, well, you know, if they, even if the snake bites me, it won't hurt me. Listen, the apostle Paul was not going around picking up snakes. But he was picking up sticks to try and warm up all the sh shipwrecked survivors to warm them up by the fire. And as he was picking up sticks, he by accident picked up a serpent. It reached over, bit him, did not harm him. Because we have a supernatural God who does miracles. But God didn't call us to be stupid either. So the apostle Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. So here's what I want to say to you. Don't go looking. I just want to challenge you with this. I'm going to jump off this cliff and see if the angels will catch me before I hit the bottom. The Lord's probably going to go, well, that was kind of ignorant. So anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying to you in the natural course of life, God is going to protect you when he chooses to want to protect you and to show out the Holy Spirit in your presence so that you'll know he is real and he is alive. And I bet if you take enough time to figure it out, many of us have seen miracles in our life. I saw a miracle a few, a couple of years ago, my wife and daughter were in a car accident where a drunk driver, they were doing 70 miles an hour down 175 and a drunk driver in the middle of the night just pulled off a side road straight into the side door where Anna was while they were no chance to slow down, just literally slammed right into their side. Uh, they should have hit a telephone pole because that's the direction they were going. There's no answer for why they didn't hit that telephone pole. In fact, 
the car somehow didn't, what should have been pushed over here, somehow ended up over here. And there is no explanation for how it ended up over here. How did y'all end up over here? We don't know. We were heading towards a telephone and the next thing I know, I look and I'm over here. And I would just say to you, there are angels who often will take charge of you and protect you and perform a miracle when you're not expecting it. This is a miracle working God and he is not limited in his scope of power. Praise God. I want to pray for you today. And here's how I'd like to pray. I'd like for us to pray for some healing and for some miracles in our life today. So I just ask you, because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if you're here today with no one looking around and every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and say, Pastor, uh, I've got an ailment, I've got a sickness, I need healing. We're not here to embarrass you, but if that's you, would you just hold up your hands nice and high so that I can see it? No one else is looking around for just a second. Okay. Okay, put them back down real quick. Put them back down. Now, I'm gonna, the reason I'm asking you to do that, I'm going to ask you in a moment to put your hands back up again, but listen. I want to tell you that the power of God is not here just in your pastor the power of God resides in believers who have the Holy Spirit of God living in them. And I want to ask some of your brothers and sisters to gather around some of you and to pray over you. So in a minute, when I ask you to put your hand back up, if you feel uh, confident and bold and unafraid, would you allow us to pray for you and allow your brothers and sisters to come surround you? So the next time when I ask you to put your hands up, I'm going to ask people to look. And I'm telling you that way so you won't be embarrassed. Okay? Heads bowed and eyes closed for just one more minute. I wonder how many of you are in this room today that you're in need of a miracle. In other words, maybe there's a marriage situation that doesn't look like it's going to work out. But you need a miracle. Or a relationship issue that doesn't look like can be fixed, but you need a miracle today. Would you, with heads bowed and eyes closed, put your hand up for just a moment? We need a miracle in our life right now. Okay, put your hand back down. Now, same offer. If you feel comfortable enough, if you need a miracle or healing, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands and people are gonna look. Okay, so I'm gonna ask everyone to look. If you feel comfortable, raise your hand. I want someone to pray for me today. Keep your hand up, just keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Okay, church, keep your hand up. Don't put it down. Church, look around. Find two or three people who are close to you right now. If you need to get up, get up. If they're in front of you, you can just lean forward. But let's lay hands on every single person who's in the room right now. Put hands on people right now. Just lean forward. Move over if you need to. Find someone to pray for right now. I'm going to pray. We're going to pray together. And in faith, we're going to believe for a miracle working God to show up in homes, in marriages, in health issues, over hearts, over lungs, over backs. I want every person to have someone laying their hands on you right now. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus for every person who's in this room right now who is in need of healing power, the supernatural intervention of the Holy Spirit in the natural course of human health. Holy Spirit, would you show up and show out right now in my brothers and in my sisters' lives right now for hearts to be healed, for lungs to be healed, for backs to be healed for blood clots to be removed, for cancer to be destroyed and wiped out. We believe for it right now in the precious name of Jesus. For homes to have miracles and for marriages to have miracles, for relationships to be restored, we're believing you for it, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Come Holy Spirit, fall on your people right now. Come Lord Jesus. And we give you all the praise and the glory. 
And if you're one of those who had hands up, just take a moment just to say to the Lord, Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for healing. Thank you for touching my life. Thank you that you care for me. And I trust you for it and I believe you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Now I'm gonna close with one last prayer and our altar team is gonna come here to the front. And if you need prayer for any reason, we wanna invite you to come today. Father God, we love you and we bless your holy name. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our house today with your people. Thank you for healing that has come in this room. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus.